All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 5th, 2023. We're still here. We're watching. We're praying. We're diligent. I'll tell you, I was talking with our brother Mike today. You know, you guys have heard me talk about that little grain of salt that I have. You know, it, I, we know it's around here somewhere. We know it will be the true feast of weeks to the Lord God. And I was talking about that little grain of salt that I always have. Well, I was telling Mike today, you know, I think that grain of salt might be the size of like a small boulder. You know, to the Lord, it might be a grain of salt. To me, I'm calling it a grain of salt, but I think it was a little bit bigger. Because it's just going a little bit further than we keep expecting, right? But what do we know? Guys, as we've matured in this, I can tell you one thing. It's taken, it took me, it's been what, close to five years since I started. Uh, sorry, close to six years since I started, but a little over five and a half years when I realized when things were, were happening, that the revelation was being revealed. And I got to tell you, it took like four and a half years to really start to mature in the sense of knowing that, you know, I know that I don't know when the date is. Nobody knows when the date is. You see, so what do we have? We have the revelation of the end of days. We have diligently sought the 70 years of the Lord and when they came into the land. We've got this year revealed from scripture, from, uh, from, uh, Isaiah, from Leviticus 19, and we've got to the end of Jerusalem 70 years. There is precisely 14 years in between the two of them. And what has happened over this past year, like I said, it's, it's a maturing in being a watchman that's taken place. I do not get as disappointed as I used to get. I really don't because I know it's around here somewhere. And like I was talking to Mike uh, earlier, there was a couple things that happened. There was a conversation with Mike a couple days ago, two, three days ago, and uh, it dawned on me. It was something I used to share on at least three years ago and even before that. And he reminded me of it. And I said, oh, my goodness, I got to bring it back up. I've got to share it because the connections are so beautiful. And what you I can guarantee you, everybody at some point in their church life, if they've gone to church or they've been watching YouTube channels and, and teachers and pastors, at some point you will have heard about this in the book of Exodus. And even years prior, I used to talk about this regularly. Well, when you understand what we do, and understand that it's truly seven Sabbaths and then numbering 50 days, when you see this, <laughs> you're going to say, then what about, wait, uh, <laughs> how does that connect to Jesus? And you're going to see that we've already revealed the answer of it, right? We've revealed the answer, and we're going to cover that today. But Mike and I, even when we were chatting, you know, knowing that it's around here somewhere, there, there's always been two options right? <laughs> There's Mark Mark texting me again. He knows I'm doing my video now. <laughs> There's your shout out, Mark. I'm just kidding. And But what happens is in this revelation, we know that there are two pieces, two, two, I shouldn't say two pieces, two possibilities of what the Lord meant in the revelation of Taurus. Taurus is the beginning i don't care how you slice it dice it what you want to say we have been given through the holy ghost that one physical confirmation in the reality that we live in the flesh that taurus is the beginning well wouldn't you know it he's called the beginning and the end you see he's called the aleph and the tav because in the beginning it started in taurus wouldn't the beginning of the end also be in Taurus? As the, gospel, as the Gospel of Thomas, right, the Apocrypha said, whoever finds the beginning, right, in the beginning, that you look for the end, for where the beginning is, there will the end be. You see, we know these things, guys. The beginning was Taurus. Now the question is, there are only two options for Taurus. And what I mean by that is it, there's two options, meaning you have the month of Sivan, okay? 
the month of Sivan is the month of Taurus. So it must begin somewhere connected to starting in Taurus. The 8th is passed. The 15th is passed, and here we are on the 16th. We're going to talk about something else maybe in this time frame. You're going to see as we progress further into it. And then we come to our third portion, our third of the three high watches that are connected to revelations, that are connected to Scripture understanding as to where they could be. It was either going to be starting from here to here, from here to here, or this here to here is really down here because of the 10 days for the moon. Those are the three options that are in the first case scenario. There's only one more scenario, but we're not gonna go into that right now. That one more scenario, we talked on extensively over the years, extensively. Do I think it's going to be that other scenario? No, I was going through this stuff with Mike, you know, we were going back and forth. And I'll tell you what, man, there are some serious connections to the second scenario. Some serious connections. We've known them for years. We've taught on them for years. And it is definitely a possibility. Do I think it's actually going to be the case? No. But if this time to the solstice comes and goes, well, then we're going to know what this meant as the 16th day of Taurus. Because what do we know, guys? The 16th day of Taurus was right here of Genesis 1. In the beginning. In the beginning, it was in Taurus. And in the beginning, it means Jesus. It is Jesus, the first fruits, the feast of first fruits, the first fruits without leaven. This is Jesus. So in Jesus, God created. So in Jesus, the Father created. What day was it? It was the 16th day. This is resurrection day. This is first fruits. This is the 16th day of the first month, and in the beginning it was Taurus. This is something we've shared on in the past. Do I think this is going to be as it was in the beginning, being the 16th day of the first month? No. Is it possible? If this comes and goes from here to here and nothing has changed, then hold on, because we've got a little bit longer. But don't worry. This is the 70th year. It's the 70th year. And, and I, I have this little desire to want to go into the second one and really break it down for you, but I'm not. I'm going to save it. We'll see what happens by the next video later in the week, between now and then. And maybe I'll introduce it uh, in the next video later in the week, or what is it, Saturday or Sunday, the next video comes out. And maybe at that point, um, I'll introduce it because we'll be so close to the next one coming within a few days. And I want to be sure everybody's just not all the, the wind taken out of their sails because there is a lot of scripture connected to the second one. A lot of scripture. All right. And Mike and I, like I said, we, we were chatting about it today. And as much as there's a lot there, there's something that really isn't there. And that is the harvest seasons. Okay? The harvest seasons. But you want to know what's really interesting? Jesus is called the Aleph and the Tav. Look at the way they have this. This is Taurus. So this is the constellation of Taurus and the crosses in it. Kind of interesting, right? I'm saying this as a side note. Why am I saying this as a side note? Because if we go to Deuteronomy 16 and we go to the three feasts of the Lord, you see, you got Passover, which is unleavened bread. This is the seven days of unleavened bread. You've got the one day of the Feast of Weeks, and then you've got the seven days of uh, tabernacles, the three feasts of the Lord. We talked about this many times. Jesus is the middle cross. The one that's on Jesus is right. So Jesus was the middle cross and there's three feasts to the Lord. Three feasts to the Lord and there were three crosses and there's pre, mid, post, but the middle is actually the beginning. And what did Jesus say to the one on his right side? He said that they would go to paradise. He said that that guy would go to paradise. 
What is that guy that goes to paradise? Well, that's where the rapture group of the great multitude goes after the seven years of seals. And then you've got the seven years of trumpets, and that's for the flesh, the portion of Judah. So it's interesting that Jesus was the middle cross, and to the guy on his right, he told him paradise, which we've taught on many times. And the guy on his left was the one representing flesh for Judah. And what do we have? Jesus, who is the beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav. This picture to me, looking at this picture, makes me think Taurus crucifixion. Was it? No. Because in Jesus' day, we know there was one month difference where the sun was from the beginning, and now we're two months difference. But here we are, Taurus again. We are right now in Taurus. And this was the date. This day right here in creation, 16th day in Taurus, was the beginning. So. It gets very, very interesting. We're at a very, very intense time, and we're gonna go, we're gonna break that down, look into it, and then we're gonna go to the story of Moses and the Exodus and the story of the Gospels to see the picture we can find in the Exodus to the Gospels and reveal that understanding and see what we can pull from it. It's awesome. We can show it, and when we do, we're gonna be able to show this connection to something else. They're, they're numbers in the thousands. You'll see what I'm talking about when we get there. And if one is true, and we found another one, and that one is the same timing, and the other one that we find, it's the same number as another number in the Old Testament, and that one represents the same timing, what do you think it means? Coincidence? I think not. I think not. You'll see when we get there. You're probably scratching your heads right now saying, what is this guy drinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm drinking my coffee, come to think of it, coffee time. So, let's get started. For anybody that's new to the ministry, we have two places that you can kind of, not kind of, but that you can begin to get caught up. You can come right here into this playlist on YouTube, okay, on our YouTube channel, and this playlist is the one called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. And of course, there's always a commercial. By the way, it's not because I... I, I choose to put in commercials. If you choose not to put them in, then YouTube puts them in. So that's why there's commercials. Um, what you can do is you come right here into this playlist and you watch these first four videos to get an understanding of what has been happening here. This 22 minute intro video is the introduction to these next three videos. It'll give you the insight into the first one, which is a 30 minute Bible study with the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. Then you'll hear some conversation in this after the Gospel portion that brings you into the revelation of the end time years, which is 14 years. And when you first hear this, you're gonna say, this guy is absurd, he's lost his mind. No, it is revealed once you understand who the Gospels are speaking to. And to understand how these, this first seven was missed, how, how did we not know who the Gospels were speaking to? How did we miss that there was another seven years that came first? It's all revealed in this final one. And the answer is because everything we have been taught from seminary schools to from pastors in church to teachers to trainers, to all of them have all been taught from the foundation of Matthew's Gospel. We've always looked and always been taught for hundreds of years that Luke and Mark were simply uh, uh, additions, right? We, we look to Matt, Mark and we look to Luke as, as ways to fill in gaps in the story in Matthew. And that's the way it's being taught in the is. You see, because there's the was, the is, and the is to come. The was was from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape. And then it starts the is to come. And what they've done is the same church, the same prophecy teachers, the same seminary students throughout the centuries have taken a learning within the is that they've done from Matthew 
and they've tried to apply it to the is to come. So they've only looked to Mark and to Luke in the same way they're doing it now using Matthew, but they're trying to do it in the prophecy of the is to come. And what they fail to understand is that Luke is speaking to the bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to, to the world, the Gentiles who are grafted into the house of Israel. And Matthew is speaking to the Jews. Now the world knows that Matthew is speaking to the Jews. The world will say the tribulation is only seven years for Judah. And they say it's pre-trib, the before the seven years of Judah, the great multitude rapture happens. Well, they're right. The only problem is because they've not understood who Mark is speaking to, it's at the end of Mark's discourse. It's at the end of Mark's gospel. You see, when you begin to understand that, you're going to realize that the church that isn't prepared, the church that is sleeping, the great multitude that will really awaken during the greatest revival in the history of mankind will happen in the midst of the tribulation of seals and especially the first couple, three years of it. Because from there, then they're going to be hiding in places all over the world. And the majority of them will survive. There'll be hundreds of millions. The majority will survive to the great multitude rapture. But that happens in the seventh year of seals. So because it hasn't been understood who Matthew, Mark, and Luke are speaking to in the is to come, it's been missed. And they only see Matthew seven years. Yet when they read the rest of scripture, it all gets twisted in because through the rest of scripture, you can see an argument for pre, mid, post. And the answer is because they're all true. In the fifth video, you're going to see a simple introduction to the typologies within the triumphal entry story, the transfiguration story, and the resurrection stories that pre, mid, and post are all true. In Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre, mid, post. That's why it's there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 2. Above 14 years, the first group goes to the third heaven. That's the typology of what Paul is portraying in the is to come typology that's built into it it's it's the story under the story it's the prophecies within the scriptures that are hidden within them that's why even before luke's uh even before mark's discourse starts you have luke's and everybody knows that luke's is very different from all of them and the reason is luke's only represents that 40 to 50 day period of time which is the above portion that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a 40 to 50 per day period of time that happens before the 14 years begins. And that's because we'll chat on it just briefly here later as we get to that section, but you're gonna see, or even as you study other portions, you're gonna understand that the white horse rider, it's the son of man. But most people can't accept that because they don't know that Messiah is coming first, okay? The, the 14 years will officially begin at the destruction of Jerusalem, them fleeing to the mountains, taken into captivity, and that'll be the beginning of World War III. And guess what? That's exactly how Mark's discourse begins, but not Luke's. So all of these things and more, you'll begin to understand with these four, the intro and the following three videos, and then you can go into the deeper things that follow it. The other place you can go, let me go out of this. It's so fascinating, man. I love, love, love to talk about those details and go into it. Man, I say this all the time, but I could do this for hours and hours and days on end. The other place you can go is into, this is the ministryrevealed.com website. Okay, there's the links, there's the menu. You can come here into the intro. Hello. Oh, let me go back then. <laughs> you can come here into the intro. Why did it do that? There we go. You can come here once you click on the intro and it'll take you here. This is that same intro video, okay? This is that same 22 minute intro video. This is the following video. And our brother Jimmy, who's awesome, awesome web developer and designer and just artist and everything. He's designed the website and every video you don't need any downloadability material. You don't have to download additional software. It's one-click download to any device. Or you could watch it, 
you can link it to the page where it has more info, and you can print the study notes that come with it. There's the second video. There's the one we were saying it's because of Matthew. And then this is the stuff we call going deeper. So then you could watch these here in order. It's awesome. It really, truly is going to answer. If you've ever had questions and wondered, I got to close this out, and wondered over the years, what are these differences in the Gospels? If you've ever gone to Luke, Mark, and Matthew's Gospel, and you see where Jesus is, before, as he's going to the cross, you're going to read. Now, you've probably only ever heard that Jesus was arrayed in a scarlet robe going to, before going to the cross, right? But if you go to Mark, you're going to see that he was arrayed in purple. If you go to Luke, you're going to see that he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe. Gorgeous means white, radiant, beautiful. Uh, were these guys colorblind? No, of course not. It's the bride, and what are the, Luke is the bride, what are Mark and Matthew? Purple and scarlet. What does Revelation 17 tell us purple and scarlet are? Tribulation colors, hello. Awesome things like that are gonna be revealed. They are mysteries of prophetic insight, of end time revelation built within the gospels, and we have shown dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of these differences within the gospels and what they mean to the end of days. It's awesome. It's so, so exciting. So where are we today? We're right here. Everybody here in the forum. So, so we also have in Ministry Revealed, when you go to the website, you can click in the, on the menu box and you can go to the forum. You can join us in the forum. There's 11, 1,200 people from all over the world in there. And in the forum, we're posting news and events going on around the world that, that we're watching, uh, prayer requests. Uh, we share with our brother Steve, who's out in Uganda, and the incredible things that he's doing out there and the mission that we support, which you can support there from the website or here at the YouTube channel. You can support there as well. Um, we, we, we share Bible studies, uh, word definitions, all sorts of things in there. You can come and join us in there for free. It takes you a few seconds to sign up and people from all over the world are there. But what everybody knows now and what we've been talking about is we know that there's 10 more days, okay? It's the 10 days difference from here to here. Now, why would we need a 10 days difference? What could be the possible understanding to a 10 days difference? Now, some people might say, well, this is the Apocrypha, right? This is from the Book of Jubilees, right? Yes, from the book of Jubilees. This is the Apocrypha, and we've shared on it many times. But let's have a listen to what it says. Let's start, uh, let's start here in this uh, verse 32. And all the children of Israel will, for, uh, uh, will forget and will not find the paths of the years and will forget the new moon and the Sabbaths and the festivals in all the order of the years will, uh, they will err. For I know, and from now, sorry, for I know, and from now on, I shall make it known to thee, and not from my heart, but thus is written in a book before me, and is ordained in the tablets of heaven, the divisions of the days, that they forget not the festivals of my covenant, and walk according to the festivals of the Gentiles, after their errors and their ignorance. And there will be those who will, who will make observations of the moon. For this one, the moon, corrupts the stated times and comes out early each year by 10 days. Okay? There's a 10-day difference with the moon. And this is something we've taught on over the last year and a half. And we, we, used to, we were touching on it quite a bit at first because we were literally able to calculate the differences over the year. Well, let me ask you something. Let me show you something. Do you realize that Taurus is the beginning to the Father? This is something we've shared, right? Just like the Gospel of Thomas, the other Apocrypha. Whoever finds the beginning finds the end, for in the end there is the beginning. Okay? We know that Genesis 1, in the beginning, it was Taurus, and it was the 16th day of Taurus. There's no getting around that. We, we've proven it. We know it. 
There's a reason why the Jews started their calendar with, uh, started their alphabet with Aleph. You see? Because Aleph was the beginning. That's where the sun rose. That's where the year started. That was their Nisan, their month one was in Taurus. And what was Jesus? What was Jesus in Genesis 1? Jesus was the first fruits, right? Jesus was the first fruits of the Feast of First Fruits. Well, who are the pre trip? Who are those who are going pre trip? We know who they are, right? They're also first fruits. Okay, there's Jesus, the Feast of First Fruits. There it is right there. The one without leaven. Who are the bride of Christ, those going pre trip? They're the first fruits with leaven. So even though we're not that same first fruits, the connection to the timing is the beginning of Genesis, which we've shown is the spirit. And then the day count starts uh, uh, the light. And then Adam starts the flesh. It's the spirit, the light, the flesh. It's Luke, Mark, Matthew. Well, it starts on the, from the 15th into the 16th of Savant. But it hasn't happened again. Yet, this is supposed to be the 70th year, right? The end of it. So how do we come to say, well, okay, then the 25th to the 26th? Well, we just read 10 days difference. If Taurus is the beginning and was the beginning, and to the Lord God, it will never change. Remember what he told Moses. Let's, let's go have a look at this as a little side note. Remember what he told Moses, I think it's Exodus 12, right at the beginning. Right here, Exodus 12, verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. When the Lord God told this to Moses, it was Taurus. Now it's Savan, the third month. You see? I'm not going in that direction yet, but this, if you look at it and say, okay, well, if the Lord God's going back to the beginning, then is he calling Taurus the first month again? Like he said to Moses. You see, they knew the constellations, guys. So if Moses was here today and Moses looked up in the sky, what would he be looking for? To begin his to begin his uh, um, his first month, if Moses was here today, and he looked up at the sky, and saw that we were now in the constellation of Taurus, do you think that Moses would be proclaiming it's month one? Darn right he would, because God told him. God literally told him it was. Why would he change? The sun sped up, but it doesn't change the fact as it goes through the constellations, Moses would always be where the one is, right? That's what we were talking about. When you look at the hour of a clock, right? The, uh, the face of a clock, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. The sun and the moon, the hour and the minute hands go around, but one is still always one. You see, that would mean Taurus is still to the Lord God, potentially still the beginning, meaning month one. Aha, uh -huh, you see? But we'll save that for later. Because there's something that, if this is month one, well, what do you do with the feasts of barley that have already passed? You see? Because barley, and if we follow the harvest season, well, the harvest, of course, is now in month one, which is two months earlier. You can't just skip over that you see what i'm saying but if the end is like the beginning and the beginning is the end and that's where you find it ah, you see this is why i was explaining at the beginning there are still two options and in the first option this is the final option and then it will lead or sorry this is the the third potential in the first option and then it leaves only one more option.
and that's what I'll save for the next video. So let me do a quick reminder. Now that we know this difference of the 10 days brings us from here to here, let me give you a quick reminder as to why that's important. Because first of all, there's a couple things it does, right? Everything that start was gonna start here would simply start here. But it's not very clean, is it? It's not very clean in the sense of, well, this was the short Israel war. And if you counted 50 days to Pentecost from there, it ended right here. Well, the seventh of Av and then the attack on Jerusalem, that made sense, right? I mean, it was so perfect. The short-lived war in Israel being repeated, right? When they captured Jerusalem, and then this one being the historical return of the destruction coming again. So is it come and gone? Well, we'll talk on it in a bit, but this still might be possible. We still might be looking at another day or two max. We're right here as I'm talking. Maybe we're looking at a day, maybe a day and a half. Okay? Is that possible? Yes. Okay? It is possible. And when I get to it, I'll explain why. But now, why is this the next important one within everything starting the 50 days in Taurus? Okay? 10 days because of the moon. Why? Because to the Lord God, this is the beginning month. So if this is the beginning like it was in the beginning, then to the Lord God, what is it? It's the end of the 70th, the 50 days start. Now this is the Lord God's 70th, not Judah's 70th, okay? This is the Lord God's 70th coming to an end, and there's your 10 days off. Not 11 and then 12 and then 13 days off as the months progress because it's like, uh, about a day, not quite, right? A day and a bit, or uh, sorry, a little less than a day for every month that goes by, right? 364 to 365 in, a, in, a, in about a quarter, right? So it's right here at the beginning. So why do we talk on this? Well, you guys know this very well. Let's go, we're, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this, but I'm gonna rehash it with you guys because let me, look at this typology here. You see, in Psalms 17, or even if you go to Psalms 117, Psalms, one, remember on our chapters to years, so you have Psalms breaks up in two ways, okay? This, these two right here equal that seven-day period of time. There is a seven-day period of time, which is while the wedding is taking place in heaven. The pre-trib happens, he anoints the apostles, he goes to the seven-day wedding, he returns after the seven days on the eighth day. During the seven days is the craziness of what happens in Psalms 18, which is directly connected with what's taking place in conversations in Psalms 118. Now, that's the seven-day portion. If you go to Psalms 117, I find it very interesting that it's the shortest verse, uh, the shortest um, uh, 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 chapter in Scripture. You know why? Because this would be connected to the escape, guys. P oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. This to me, looks like the pre-trip, sounds like, bang, it's the shortest, it's the division of the Bible, they say as well, and then the second half of the Bible starts. This would be like the division, this is the pre-trip escape, and bang, the end of days start. So whether you go Psalms 118, or going back to Psalms 18, and you see the chaos that breaks out in here, we've talked about the chaos that happens during the seven-day wedding that's in heaven, and the chaos that takes place on the earth, we see the channels of waters. He delivers that group, his, his remnant bride workers. He sets them in a large place. We know he's going to have a meal with them. He's rewarding them. They, they have powers and abilities that will be given. And then what happens? What is that connection to when he comes? Psalms 19. Let's read Psalms 19, starting in verse 1. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God. 
and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. Okay? It's the constellations telling the story. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun. Now listen to this. Which is as a bridegroom. So the sun, S-U-N, is as the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing as a strong man ready to run a race. His going forth is from one end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. Okay? What's the circuit? This is something we've taught on many times. It's the circuit of the sun. So it's the course of the sun, but it's also a meaning and, a, and an understanding for a revolution of time. So it could be like saying going to the 29th of Elul and then Tishri 1. Okay, that's a, an end of a year and a start of the year on the Hebrew calendar. So that is a lapse of time. But the other one is called the end and the beginning. So from the sun to the sun. But the question has always been, well, is that the spring equinox, the summer solstice, the autumn equinox, or the winter solstice? Well, it's interesting because there's only what? Summer and winter. There's only summer and winter. Now, that gets kind of interesting, right? There's only summer and winter. But because the sun has moved by two months, is summer really over in the spring now? So is that really where summer was? <laughs> you see? So you're left kind of scratching your head with it, right? Or is summer really still where it is now? And you've got six months with the autumn and that's actually summer? Or is it spring to the end of summer? That's summer. No. It starts at summer. The connection is summer. And so this circuit of the sun would appear to be telling us the, co the course or the circuit of the sun is from the summer solstice to the summer solstice. And so if it's summer solstice to summer solstice, how awesome is it that only this year, remember I, told, I was telling you in recent videos and even in the last one, that over a 25 year period that I've looked at from in the teens, uh, 20, like 15 to 2040, the only place where the 15th of Savan lands on June 4th is only in 2023. What? Who cares, right? Why does that matter? Well, because 10 days later is the 14th, okay, is the 14th of June. Okay, big deal. What does that matter? This is why it matters. Because if the 25th, because of the 10 days of the moon, is really to the Lord saying, hey, the sun is accounted for because now we, we're in Savan, which is Aleph, the beginning, and you still need to account the 10 days for the moon, and now we've accounted the 10 days from the moon. It would be like looking at whatever we were looking at here, we're now looking at here. Okay, so what do we mean? Well, this starts the 50-day count. If this starts the 50-day count, what do you get? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven days and then what? Circuit of the sun, here comes the Lord. After the seven-day wedding, the Lord comes on the eighth day, what? As a strong man ready to run a race. When? At the circuit of the sun of the summer solstice. You see? To me, this is a big deal. This is why it was included in the three watches like we have never had before in Taurus. You see, guys, we have to understand. I need you guys to understand this. It is going to begin. The pre-trib is connected to Taurus being like Christ in the beginning. The Aleph. The Aleph. So the question is, 
is it's going to be the 8th to the 9th, the 15th to the 16th of Savan, or the 25th to the 26th of Savan. In option one, those are the only options. And this year, this is the only option that it will ever happen in. This doesn't happen in any other year. Let me just, I'll show you one, just so you guys get an idea. Let's go to 2024. Watch this. Just to give you a visual, okay? Here's the 15th to the 16th of Savant, okay? At the circuit of the sun. Well, if it's connected to his birth at the circuit of the sun, as him coming out as a strong man, that's not the beginning. You see? It's got to be what? It's got to be from the seven to the eight days later. Well, it's already past the circuit of the sun when he comes on the eighth day. You only find it in 2023. Only in 2023. I know what some people are saying. They probably just saw it and they said, oh, look at that. Oh, actually, you know what? I was in the wrong spot. Let me go back. So what was it? Watch this, watch this, watch this. Okay, we weren't looking for this date because what we were saying, this, remember, moves 10 days. So we'd be looking down here. You see that? It moves 10 days. This isn't the circuit of the sun. The circuit of the sun is over here. It's completely out of place. Only in 2023, does the eighth day after the seven day wedding land at the Lord coming at the start now at the time of the circuit of the sun? We know there is serious implications to it, right? And some people might say, when I came to Psalms, whoops, where are you going? When I came to Psalms, somebody might say, well, What's the big deal? How do you know? What's this chapters to years thing all about? How do you know that that's actually something that's connected to end time understanding? We've spent five years showing the revelation built into these chapters of Psalms. We know that there are the Psalms of Ascent in the Septuagint count. We've understood it. We've been breaking this down for a long time. But where else do we see that it talks about it? Right here. Right here. Remember, Luke chapter 24 is a picture of the Lord coming to begin his 40 days. And he's talking with this group in Luke. And you only find this conversation in Luke. That he says that all these things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. These are things that are still yet to be fulfilled in the prophetic revelation of the is to come. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. We've shown the prophetic understanding of this word, which includes knowing who the beast will be in the mark of the beast. Okay, the Psalms are right there. It tells us. Well, what about this? Here's the other thing we were talking about a moment ago, okay? We saw the in the Gospel of Thomas and the Apocrypha, right? That conversation of the Apocrypha. And <laughs> you see how awesome this is? Here Thomas is in the Gospel of Thomas, and it's about discovering that in the beginning is where the end is, and the end is in the beginning. Whoever finds it will not experience death. And then we go to John chapter 20, which is the end time typology. It plays two things. You know what it plays? The beginning and the end. <laughs> right? John chapter 20 is a picture of the beginning of the 50 days, but it's also what? A picture of the end when the Lord comes back after his again when he returns feet down. You see? It's both. It's the beginning and the end. It's the Aleph and the Tav. Do, do you get it? This is why I was saying when you look at a picture like this and you look at it for the end time understanding, it begins in Aleph. And when it ends, what do we know he's going to do again? 
Tav, right? And here we come to John chapter 20. And John chapter 20 is a picture of the beginning. And it's also a picture of the end. The Aleph and the Tav in John chapter 20. It's amazing. It's so amazing. And so again, here we have the Gospel of Thomas and him and Jesus giving him that answer. And we know that when the when the 50 days begin, the Lord is going to start by breathing on whoever these modern day apostles are going to be that are chosen. The the pre-trib escape. So here's how I, I believe I have understood it to play out. We see from Luke 12, he's going to meet with the disciples. I believe he's going to meet with the disciples right from the very beginning, okay? Right even before the escape, before he meets with the apostles. I believe that's what this tells us right here. It says in Luke 12, starting verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. So he's telling them, before, right before he goes to the wedding. Be ready when I return from the wedding. This is the disciple Luke group from Luke chapter 24. Okay? And then we go to John chapter 20, and it starts the 50 days, and we've got the typology as we've shared with Mary Magdalene. Okay? Mary Magdalene is the typology of his of the bride, right? I not saying that Jesus married her, right? There's that whole uh through Catholicism, I believe it is. And they'll say, you know, different sects believe that uh, Jesus actually married Mary Magdalene. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. She is a typology of the pre-trib escape of the bride. And then what happens? Then the Lord comes back on the same day at evening. And what does he do? He meets with the apostles that were gathered and he breathes on them. They receive what we call that Acts 2.0, or not the Acts 2.0 yet, but they receive that incredible power of the Holy Ghost. And then what happens? Then Jesus leaves. He's now gone to the wedding. When he returns from the wedding, you see, Thomas wasn't there. There's the first mention of Thomas. And then what happens? Jesus comes again after eight days. And this time, Thomas is there. So you see what happens? One, two, three, four, five, six verses. And Thomas's name is one, two, three, four, five times in six verses. We have Thomas's name. But Thomas doesn't get to see him until the Lord returns on the eighth day. Which is what? After the wedding, it would seem that the first group that he's going to meet are the apostles. And then he's going to go meet on the same eighth day. He's going to go meet the disciples from Luke 24, who he had said to be ready. Okay, so what do we get from Thomas? Thomas means the twin. What do we know about Thomas being the twin? You see, Thomas means twin. And by chance, Thomas's name is used five times in six verses. There's got to be a reason for it. Well, lo and behold, what is Tammuz? Tammuz is the fourth month in the Hebrew calendar, but what is it? It's, it's, uh, um, oh shoot, what is it? <laughs> the twin constellation. It's the twin constellation. Almost like saying, when the Lord comes back at the circuit of the sun after seven days on the eighth day, when he comes back after the wedding, Thomas, 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 twin. You see, Gemini, there you go. This is Gemini. But where does it begin? It still begins in Taurus. And then you've got Gemini, which is Thomas, twin, and you've got the circuit of the sun. Both John chapter 20 and Psalms 19 that we've shown and correlate to the 40 days of the Son of Man beginning right here. This is why you cannot simply just disregard it. Okay? What else do we get in this connection? Well, the one that we've shared on many, many times, like a broken record because it's so awesome, is 
we see Jesus and the connection to Jesus coming what? Okay, a child is born unto us when? After the light affliction that happens in the two northern cities of Israel. The thing we've been talking about forever, that in northern Israel, I believe it's Haifa and Tel Aviv will be attacked and destroyed or attacked in major devastation and a short-lived war in the Middle East will take place during the seven days of the wedding. And then what does it say? In Isaiah 9 verse 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the shadow, in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. You see, Jesus is the light. What does this represent? What does this light affliction represent that comes first? The seven days. That represents the seven days before what? The great light that comes and shines in the darkness. Well, isn't that funny? In John chapter 8, in the chapters to years, we have this this bride, this, this adulterous woman, right? This, this Gentile representation of a woman standing before him, a stone's about to be thrown, which represents during the week wedding. Here he is, bent over, was writing on the ground, only her left standing in the midst. And what is he? Verse 12 of John 8, bam! So you have a representation of what? Seven days, and on the eighth day, the light comes. I am the light of the world. He who follows me. See, you shall not walk in darkness, shall have the light of life. We see this everywhere. Even if we go to Luke chapter 2, like we shared in the previous video. You go to Luke chapter 2, and who is this light? Right? Luke chapter 2, verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles, comma, and the glory of the people of Israel. This is what this is about the birth of Christ representing his 40 days. What is it in Isaiah 9? Same thing going on. Here he is, and it's connected to his birth. Now, why does it matter? Now you're saying, oh, so his birthday's not on the 15th of June, it's it's over here. Well, let's not forget something. With the sun having moved two months, because it's it's a little bit more than two months now, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. It's a little bit more than two months, right? It's two months every few thousand, every couple thousand years, but then it's a little bit extra, right? We're getting close to the end. And then you've got the moon off. So to know precisely which day, remember the story with Habakkuk, right? When we were talking about the Essenes and, and the teacher and so forth, with Habakkuk and the revelation that they pulled from it, it was that Habakkuk got revelation and, and wrote these things so that, when the person comes by and reads it speedily. But what did it say about Habakkuk? He wasn't given when the end of days would begin. You see that? There was still no date given. There's no date given. We're discerning these things through Scripture. We're in that range. And one of the ways to know the range is exactly what we were talking about here with Psalms 19. Day unto day, night unto night, they utter a speech. They show knowledge. It's in the sun, moon, and stars. And Jesus is the Aleph. He's the beginning. It's Taurus. The Holy Spirit revealed and gave us Taurus, being right on target. The ministry of the bull's eye. So we're seeing all of these things that if this then starts one and this goes to the end of the seven-day wedding, Bang, the Lord comes on the eighth day. In Didymus, the twin Thomas, right? And connected to the circuit of the sun. Do we have another connection to it? Of course we do. Whoops. Man, I'm all fingers. I think it's because I, I cut my finger. I had a paper cut today, and I'm trying to use the other finger as I was doing earlier today, setting things up. Let's go to... John chapter 3. We all know this one, right? Let's see. Let's start in John chapter 3, verse 28. You yourselves bear witness 
that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Listen to this. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because he is the bridegroom's boy, he, because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore is, this my joy, therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. You see, what, when we read this, we've all been told by the church that that means Jesus was born at Hanukkah, right? And at one point I was believing that too, that Jesus was born at Hanukkah and John was born at the Feast of Weeks, right? Or in those time frames, which would be what? The winter solstice and the summer solstice. But guess what? Jesus is the Alpha. Aleph, Taurus, or where Taurus is now in the third month. He, he wasn't, he wasn't at, the, at the lowest part. You see, Jesus has to increase, but I must decrease. So John is the one who needs to decrease. So here he is, Jesus now increased, and what does John need to do? John, from this point of Christ now showing up, John needs to what? Decrease. What does the church tell us about the birth of Christ? They put it at Christmas time around the, summer, about around the winter solstice. What do we know the truth is? That Jesus was born, we would say the 15th day of the third month, but it was what? Around the time of the summer solstice. You see? It's making sense. And, and what was John just saying? He that has the bride is the bridegroom. What is, what's, what's the context? At the circuit of the sun. It's either at the summer solstice or it's at the winter solstice. Now we know it's not the winter solstice because he's now increasing. He has come. He's at the top of the sun, the increase at the summer solstice. And now John must decrease. And now it's decreasing, right? It's going to decrease to the time of the winter solstice. It's the opposite of what the church told us. What did the church tell us? Seven years. It's 14 years. What, the, what, is, what do most people tell you about creation? Ah, it's seven years. They tell you the days were just part of the story of the creation of Adam. No, it's seven and seven. Seven days, 7,000. Those seven days are as thousands, and the 7,000 are as days to the Lord. It's 14 years. And then you've got the little gap portion. So <laughs> here's the exact conversation about the circuit of the sun. And here's the exact conversation about the bridegroom who has his bride. And in Psalms 19, we're seeing the conversation of the circuit of the sun and the bridegroom having now come out of his chamber because what would be the context? When you're coming out as a strong man out of the chamber, why? What were you doing in your chamber? You were with your bride. So when is he coming out? He's coming out just like John said, at the circuit of the sun. He already has his bride. Now he's coming out ready to run a race. <laughs> you see? You see why we're excited about this time? Why we're still all eyes? Guys, it's awesome stuff. Watch this. I noticed some wording in the seven churches, in particular at the begin near the beginning. Okay? We have Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. That is the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus 
are those disciples, uh, sorry, are the apostles that we were talking about in John chapter 20, okay? The apostles in John chapter 20, this represents the beginning of the 50 days. When he returns after the seven-day wedding, then Smyrna starts. This represents the eighth day when he comes to begin the 40 days. Both of these groups, the apostles and the disciples, the John that represents the apostles and the Luke that represents the disciples, they're going to be here during seals, okay? And then, of course, we've broken down. We've got the video on the seven churches. Pergamum, this is when Antichrist gets his power to continue, right? For 42 months, it's the time of the Antichrist. And we've broken all that down. That's, you know, give or take two and a half years into seals <coughs> when they flee to the wilderness. So look at the wording that we find here. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it says um, uh, that ha who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Then what do we see? We go to Smyrna. It says, saith, let me give this a better highlight. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, now sorry, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, the beginning of Smyrna, it says the first and the last. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? You have the first and the last, and yet this one is holding the seven stars in his right hand and the golden candlesticks. Watch this. If you go back to Revelation 1, do you guys remember what I told you? He speaks. Briefly, he informs the Luke disciple Smyrna group first before he takes them to the wedding. Okay, so what's going to happen? He's going to let that group know right before the wedding. How far in advance? I have no idea. Maybe an hour, maybe a moment. I have no idea, but he's going to let them know because they're watching, they're praying, they're diligent. Could you imagine doing all the things and seeking the Lord and loving and repentant? And the pre-trib happens and you wake up and you're left. Ah! <laughs> you see, the workers will be informed before it happens according to the layout of Luke chapter 12. So listen to what happens. It's the Luke group that gets informed. The rapture group, will, the, the pre-trib will happen. And then he's coming back still on that, eighth, uh, that, that first day of the 50 in the evening. He's coming back and then... He's going to inform or anoint the apostles, okay? But he will have informed the Smyrna group even before it started. Don't forget, the Smyrna group is a very, very special group of workers to the Lord. They're the ones who will have part in the resurrection to rule and reign with him in the millennial reign. Everybody else stays in the third heaven. The rapture group, they stay in paradise. This is the only group who have put their necks on the line during the tribulation who will be resurrected to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign when all of those who have the promise of Israel, the promise of Jerusalem, right? His people who are from time past and so forth will be resurrected for their promised millennial reign. These guys, Smyrna, will have part in that resurrection millennial reign with them. Remember what it said? Let's go to Romans 11 real quick. This is a great reminder. You see, what's coming for the what's coming for the uh, um for the pre-trib group going to the third heaven is glorious, right? I don't know anybody who would rather be here during the millennial reign. I mean, out I mean surviving and just being, you know, people there in the millennial reign than being in the third heaven. I would much rather be in the third heaven, right? But don't forget what he said to them. Look at this in Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather that, uh, that through their fall, salvation has come to the, unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now listen to this. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, listen to this, how much more their fullness. Do you know why? 
Verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, right? The world, the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel. What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? You see, the vanishing of the pre-trib is going to be spectacular for everybody going to the third heaven. But the actual event itself of what is going to happen when the Lord ends the time of tribulation, returns feet down, destroys all the enemies, and then what? Resurrects the dead who had the promise, you see? Of them, for, for the Jews, not the world, for the Jews. They're going to receive something even greater than the vanishing appeared to be. They're going to be resurrected from the dead. <laughs> uh, that's pretty crazy, right? Imagine what the world's going to see. But not only they, the church of Smyrna, the remnant Luke 24, worker remnant bride, will also take part in this. And the Lord said, this is greater an event than even those that went pre-trib. Does that mean the third heaven isn't as good as the millennial reign will be? No, I don't think so. I think it's more so talking just about this event, right? Just this event. So look at this. Knowing now that he says walking in the midst, right? He has the seven churches. Uh, he's walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks. But Smyrna, he says that he's the first and the last. And what does he do? He meets with Smyrna first, then the pre-trib, then he meets with the Ephesus group, okay? And then he goes to the seven-day wedding. He returns on the eighth day. And now he's here to spend that time with the Smyrna group. Look at the wording. Listen to what this says. Okay, where is it? Right here. In Revelation 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am, listen to this, the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, I and, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Listen to this, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand. And the seven golden candlesticks. You see what happened here? A group that falls or him saying as if he falls dead, standing before the Lord. And then you have the story of the seven stars in his hand and the seven candlesticks. When we come here, we see him holding the seven stars and the, and the seven candlesticks, right? And we come to Smyrna and it says what? Sayeth the first and the last. Yet in Revelation 1, we have the story of the first and last coming first, and then the story of the seven stars and the seven candlesticks. I believe that's a little hint, a little insight again, to knowing that he's actually going to meet with these guys first, just briefly, right before the pre-trib. Now follow this story, watch this. What do we know then is gonna happen before he anoints these guys by breathing the Holy Ghost on them like Revelation chapter 20. What's he going to do right before he comes back on the same day, on the same beginning 50th day, when he returns back at the same day and evening and breathes on this apostle group? What happens before that? Well, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Guys, are you ready to see this? Are you ready to see this firsthand? And immediately I was in the 
spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat to look upon, uh, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Do you guys realize everybody being taken to the third heaven when this happens in this 70th year at the Lord God's true end of, of the Feast of Weeks? This is what we're about to see. Everybody going to the third heaven is about to witness this right here. Pretty crazy, right? Let's continue with this. Watch this. Now, you'll remember also when it comes to Revelation, that in Revelation, you see, <laughs> it's obvious that when tens of millions of people vanish, the tribulation has started. But it's not, quote unquote, the 14 years yet of tribulation. It's, it's strange, isn't it? Is it tribulation? Yes, of course it's tribulation, but until Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed and they flee, the 14 years will not have begun. Okay? So, what do we see here? In Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, we see the Son of Man as the white horse rider. And let me help some people out. Some people say, well, how can Jesus be the white horse rider? How can the Son of Man be the white horse rider? He's the one opening the seals. Yeah. And guess what? When the first seal opens, the events happen. The second seal doesn't open until he's already returned. You see, he is only here for 40 days. He is only here for 40 days. When he returns at the end of 40 days, he will open the second seal. So the question is, and this is what I'm building into, the question is, how are those 50 days going to play out that include his 40 days? There are only two options. There are only two options. Well, consider this. If the white horse, it is the Son of Man, not if, but if the white horse rider is the Son of Man, which it is, and this is the beginning of the, the 40 days of the Son of Man, and this is when he comes as light, okay? This is when he comes as light. What did we see here? In John chapter, oops, in John chapter 8. We had a picture of what? We had a picture of him standing before the Gentile woman, right? An adulterous woman is also a picture of a Gentile, right? Dogs, uh, adulterous, okay? It's just another typology for Gentile, unfortunately, okay? So this is a picture of him standing before the Gentile bride, as we shared earlier and many times before, standing before only her now standing in the midst while he's bent over, everybody's gone, and it's just... Him kind of looking like he's on bent knee who is writing on the ground and she's just standing before him. And then look what it says. I am the light of the world. Okay, this is him coming now to start his 40 days. The light in the darkness. The light in the darkness is the picture of him coming to start his 40 days. So what is this a picture of? The wedding in heaven, the seven day wedding. So this this typology of of this beginning luke portion this bride portion isn't really about the entirety of the 40 or that 50 days of luke's discourse it's really we're talking about luke chapter 1 that that wedding portion that represents those 7 to the 8 days of john's circumcision of john's birth <coughs> that comes before the 40 days and this, this picture that we see right here is exactly what we saw in Isaiah 9. Okay? The exact same thing we saw in Isaiah 9. So what would this be really a picture of right here 
from John 8, verse 12. It would be a picture of Revelation chapter 6, verse uh, 1 and 2. Okay? The Son of Man coming as the white horse rider. So what's the what happens before this 40 days of the Son of Man as the white horse rider? The wedding. The seven-day wedding. This is him coming. When he breaks that seal, this is him coming on that eighth day after the seven-day wedding. This is exactly what it is. So if we take this back into Genesis 1, we talk about this, verse 1 and 2, the gap theory of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We know that it could represent, you know, two things in its typology. Meaning, well, you can even say there are three things that are connected to it. One, we know it's another 7,000 year or seven day period to the Father. Because the entire mystery of creation to the end of time is 21 days and the 22nd is the new beginning. Just like the 21 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. To the Lord God, they are all as days. If we were here in this gap theory creation of verse 1 and 2, to us to look upon in the time of the flesh time that we're living in, in the, in the, in the, um, we're living in the dimension of time. If we were there in the dimension of time looking at that, it would have been 7,000 years. Just like the seven days of creation, to the Lord God, they were days. But if we were looking at it, in the dimension of time from the flesh, it would have looked like 7,000 years. That's why from the dimension of flesh, which is the creation of Adam, we are living in what? The thousands of years, which is 6,000 and then the 7,000th, the millennial reign. The end, the, it's the revelation of 777 and 1. Just like the menorah, the almond blossoms, seven, seven, it's three on one side, three on the other, one in the middle, three on one side, three on the other, one side, one in the middle, three on one side, three on one side, one in the middle, and then bang, one in the middle near the top. Seven, 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 one. It is the revelation of creation. It is 21 and 22 days to the Father. It is 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 in the final millennial reign to us if in the time of flesh. And in the end of days, it is seven years, seven years, and seven years, and then eternity. Or, you know, the, the yeah, it would, it would actually be their promise, right? The, that period of time. And this is what we see, right? This is exactly what our chart is. But what were they? They were seven easy years. It's, it's, the, it's the spirit filling everybody, waking up the bride, getting everybody ready. And the only final portion of days that counts are the short period, just like Jacob. Set this first seven years flew by like days. Okay? And that's this picture that we always talk about in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. It's a picture of, of the first 50 days. But if you notice what I was just leading you in, is that you could probably even say, that this isn't even so much the first 40, 50 days, or 50 days, you could even say this is a picture of the first seven. You know why? Because when the Son of Man comes for 40 days, which is after the seven, so those in the beginning, going pre-trib, those that are spirit filled with the spirit of God as the sons and daughters of God who are co-heirs with Christ. You see, they're going pre-trip. And when the son of man comes after the seven days to start the eighth day of the, uh, after the wedding to start his 40 days on the eighth day, which prayerfully we've understood will be at the time of the circuit of the sun. What does he come as? Genesis 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Who is this light? Christ. 
right? Just like John chapter one, the word in the beginning was the word, right? It was the spirit. Then the word was made what? Light. Then the light was made flesh. You see, spirit, light, flesh. <clears throat> Many of you guys know this. But what do we know about Christ when he came at his birth? He was pronounced the light of the world. The light of the world, right? To the Gentiles, to the world, and to Israel. And the glory of Israel. So we can actually look at this as not only a picture of the first quote unquote 50 days, but really, I think a closer inspection of this is really a picture of the first seven days. Because when the Son of Man comes, he is that light. Isaiah 9 even told us. Isaiah 9 was after that first light affliction in northern Israel, which happens during the seven day wedding in heaven. It's the attack in northern Israel that happens during that week. And when he comes after that week, what happens? He's coming as light, which is connected, just as Isaiah said, to his birth. For unto us a child is born. They saw a great light in the darkness. He's coming to shine his light in the darkness. We can see it from Luke chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 9, John chapter 8. All of it is a picture, even more precisely, of the seven-day wedding. And you could even say those remnant bride who are also the first fruits workers, spirit filled with the spirit of God, who will what? Endure as he did, like Romans 8 said. Because they're going to what? They'll take part in his glory, it says. That's the Smyrna group. So this would be a picture in verse 3 of what? Of the Son of Man being birthed and the 40 days starting. Then you could look to verse 4, or even you can say even verse 4. You could even say verse 4 is still part of the 40 days. So Genesis 1, verse 3 and 4, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. That was Christ. It represented Christ when he was born in the 40 days starting. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. Bang. John 8, Isaiah 9. And then you come to verse 5, and the light, see, and called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now you can look at verse 5 as being the beginning of the 14 years. You see that? Do you see how this breaks down and how you could see that now by going into Revelation 6? Because Revelation 6, verse 1 and 2, is the Son of Man here for 40 days. Is it officially the tribulation? Yes, but no. Because the real tribulation, people will be in, in awe, people will be freaking out, it will be chaos, there will be devastation on the earth, tens of millions of people have vanished, you're going to have an attack in northern Israel. But the red horse rider, is where it all begins when the craziness of tribulation will really kick off. You see, in verse 3, we see that the second seal was open. And in verse 4 of Revelation 6, it says, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Well, when is peace taken from the earth? At the end of the 50 days. You're going to see where I'm leading with this at the end of the 50 days, okay? That peace was taken from the earth. Well, that means the Holy Spirit is taken. You see, what happens? There's gonna be the Acts 2.0. This is what I was saying earlier. We know there is what's called an Acts 2.0. At Pentecost, at true Pentecost this year, the anointing of the Holy Ghost that the apostles had already received, now, the disciples will receive it. 
in this Acts 2.0. They receive it, and then what? Then the Holy Ghost is taken from the earth. Only the disciples and the apostles, it'll be like the is from, from the time of Christ, starting again, but way more intense. And listen to what it says, to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, now they're gonna start to kill one another when peace is taken and a great sword is given. Well, what do we know about this in Zechariah? We can go to Zechariah chapter eight. And we know Zechariah, Zechariah eight is a picture of the start of the seven years of trumpets. The Lord is there on Mount Zion. It says, let their hands be strong because now they're going to start rebuilding. See, the seven years of trumpets, the first seven years, the first half of the seven years of trumpets, they're going to be rebuilding the city, the streets, and the temple. And what does he say? For in Zechariah 8, verse 10, for before these days, there was no hire for man, nor hire for beast, neither was there any peace. So there was no peace because peace was taken away at the red horse rider. To him that went out or came in, why? Because of the affliction. For I set every man, everyone against all men, every against everyone against his neighbor. This, he's telling you, for the first seven years there was no peace, because I set everybody against each other. That's exactly the red horse rider. What does Ezekiel twenty-one say? You guys will remember this one. In Ezekiel chapter twenty-one, it's the typology <coughs> of the Son of Man. Sir, give me one second. Ah, see, you didn't even know I left. My daughter was calling to get picked up from work. I'm like, it's video night. Mom should know to pick you up. Oh, well, she's going to have to wait a little bit longer for mom to go pick her up. All right. So we know here from Ezekiel, he's called the son of man. Why? Because he is a picture. He is a prophetic picture of the son of man. You see, what is he doing? He's warning. He is to warn Jerusalem and prophesy against the land of Israel. You see that? Why is he prophesying? Because the Lord is saying what? The Father is saying, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. He's about to give it into the hand of the slayer. You see, this is what's going on. It's the same story. Now let's go back into the New Testament and see what Mark's discourse, which starts the 14 years after Luke's discourse, and look at what Luke's discourse, uh, Mark's discourse says. When does the tribulation begin in Mark's discourse? For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. <clears throat> There's the beginning of it right there. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Luke's is the only one where we get in, you see, where is it starting in verse 10, then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation. So see, this is the end of the 50 days. That's why he's saying unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What does Luke 21, 12 say? But before all these, okay? So in front of, but before. Before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What is that period of time? The 40 to 50 days. You see? So we're seeing this, this imagery, this picture that I think is a little more precise and a little bit more clear in its understanding that we could even say this is the representation of the first seven days. And this is when the Son of Man was born and is connected to when he comes for 40 days. And he comes, he divides the light from the darkness, and then we have the picture of day one or the first year. Then it will be nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom is the picture. Okay, day one as the beginning of the 14 years. Guys. It's all connected. And every single one of them is telling us what? The light from the darkness. The light from the darkness. If he's coming on the eighth day to shine his light in the darkness, what else do we see? Uh, 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 um, what was I going to say? 
The light from the darkness. Oh, where was I going with that? Give me one second. It was a little side note. Um. Oh, to shine his light in the darkness. I tried to pause to say, oh, where was it again? Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't recall it. But to shine his light in the darkness again. Oh, there you go. That's what it was. Thank you, Lord. You see, because what do we know? If we go to Genesis chapter 8, look at what it says. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, and summer and winter. We've covered this a few times in the past. You don't find spring and fall or autumn in Scripture. You only find the words summer and winter. So if winter is darkness and summer is the light, doesn't that also connect with the solstice? See what I'm saying? And remember, everything that was connected from the 15th to the 16th moves to here. So everything that we've talked about <clears throat> that was the seventh Sabbath and connected to the start of the 50 days, this simply becomes the seventh Sabbath and the start of the 50 days. It's the adjustment for the 10 days. So every single thing that we were looking in from the last video and that we've been talking about for a while that was connected to here is connected to here. That's it. That's the difference. But what happens? You get the seven day wedding and then you have him returning at the circuit of the sun. Shining his light, dividing the darkness, winter, right? Winter and spring until the solstice of summer, which is now summer, which is summer and fall until winter. Dividing the darkness from the light. Which will be also an attack that takes place during the seven days to which he will shine his light to those who are in the darkness in that northern part of Israel as well. It's just awesome. It's so exciting, guys. I hope you're seeing and you're understanding these things. It's the Aleph and the Tav. If he is the Aleph and the Tav and the Aleph is the beginning and it was in the beginning and Aleph is the third month and it's Savan, shouldn't that be the beginning? And if it was the 16th day in Taurus, and yet we do have actual writings, apocryphal writings, which in some churches they are still in Bibles, and you got the Book of Jubilees telling you it'll be 10 days off, and everybody knows the sun is off, right? The sun fell out of the firmament. The moon fell out of the firmament. They're a representation of what? They're also a quote-unquote typology of the Antichrist and the false prophet. You see? We, we did videos. We've spoken on that in the past. They've both fallen out of the firmament. So if they've both fallen from the firmament because they're fallen and they're the picture, well, you've got the sun two months off and you've got the moon off as well. Okay? So now, let's get to some more exciting stuff about this period of time right here. Okay, check this out. Let's go to, back again to John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, we've understood this story for a long time, okay? We've talked on it a number of times. And what is this story? Again, I love that little catch now today, man. Because John chapter 20 is the beginning and the end. It's the Aleph and the Tav. What comes first? Aleph. Aleph is when he's coming on, right? When it all starts and when he's coming the eighth day. And then what is he? The Tav, when he does it again and he returns. Crazy. He is the Aleph and Tav in John 20. But what do we know John 20 represents? Okay? We know that John 20 is a picture of the beginning of the 50 days. To which, as we explained earlier, he's going to pre-trib. Then he's going to return and anoint the apostles and breathe on them. 
He's going to return after seven days on the eighth day again. Okay? He's going to meet with the apostles just briefly. And on the same eighth day, which is the start of his 40 days, he's going to meet with the Luke group who are represented by the two on the road to Emmaus. I've said it many times that this, this, these two on the road to Emmaus are the typology of, I believe, who are the Priscilla and Aquila workers represented as those who put their necks on the line, the Smyrna remnant bride portion. These are the ones who we, he will have pre-told just shortly before to be ready when he returns from the wedding. He's going to take them to a large place. He's going to empower them. He's going to have a meal with them. And they are a representation, I believe, in the Revelation that they represent Dan of the good side, the eagle, just like Priscilla and Aquila, that means eagle, and the Ephraim side, the two tribes that are missing from the 144,000 replaced by Levi and by Joseph. Okay. Now, you're also going to see that I believe they're also Levites. I believe they're all the priestly line. Meaning in the 144,000, I believe they're all going to be the priestly line. And these two representing Ephraim and Dan are also from among the priestly line. Remember, because they were within the tribes as well, right? There were some from among them all. And you're going to see what I mean as we go further into this. So you have the pre-trib, you've got the eighth day. Then on that same eighth day, he comes and meets these two. He sits down, he eats with them, and he serves them, just like he said he would in Luke chapter 12. And then what happens? He tells them, right, these things that, it, that still must be uh, understood. He's going to open unto them the revelation of the things that we've been learning here. He's going to complete it. And he's going to open their understanding also that will take them through seals and the mark of the beast. And then what does it go on? He goes on to tell them, what their work is, right? That they're going to go out and they're going to start by going out from Jerusalem, right? Because they got to wait for the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50th day, okay? Wait for the promise of my father. From Luke, so it starts in John the 50 days. After seven on the eighth day, then it goes into Luke. They follow him for 40 days and it takes you into Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one, we know just like the end of Luke, the 40 days have come to the end. He was telling them of things of the kingdom of God, which is where the pre-trib group went to the third heaven. And the rapture group is also, the, the mid-trib rapture group is also going to the kingdom of God, but they're going to the kingdom of God in the paradise portion. Okay, so all these things were told to them. And then what does it say in Acts chapter one, verse five? For John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Okay? So what does that mean? In the order of John into Luke, into Acts 1, and into Acts 2, the order to Pentecost is after seven days to the eighth day. So the 50 days escape. The Lord returns on the eighth day. Seven days have passed. He comes on the eighth day and the 40 days begin. When the 40 days are over, that's a total of 47 days that have been complete. It leaves three days, which we saw in Acts chapter two is not many days hence. You see, the church world will tell you it was 40 days and then they waited in the upper room for 10 days. 10 days is many days. They did not wait for 10 days. It's the order from John into Luke into Acts is the story of the 50 days. So I personally had always believed that out of the two options, this is the one that we will experience. It's the pre-trib escape, the seven-day wedding. The Lord returns for 40 days, and after those 40, there's three more days to which they will then receive the Holy Ghost anointing, okay? Then they will receive the Holy Ghost anointing at the 50th day, and then they will go out from Jerusalem, bang, Jerusalem will be attacked, and the 14 years will begin, okay? 
That is the picture of the beginning. That's the way I've always looked at it as well. Okay. Well, we're going to go a little bit further into this. Okay. Let me follow my track here. Okay. The next piece is we just saw 7, 40, and then 3. Now, I've always believed that's the one out of the two options. Now, what do I mean the two options? Well, we have one more count. We have the count from Exodus, right? I'll bet you that every one of you, let me go to this, check this out. If I go to Exodus chapter 32, I'll bet you every single one of you have heard through pastors, through your church over the decades, through online teachings, whatever it is, everybody who is a Christian at some point, I would say everybody, or for the most part, depending how long you've been a Christian, have had this taught to you right here. In Exodus 32, verse 28, it says, well, let me, let's, let's back up. We know that Moses, who was up there for 40 days and 40 nights, right? But it started with a count of 50 days, didn't it? Remember, it was, it was um, three days, then the seven, and then the 40 days and 40 nights. We're going to cover that in a moment. And what happens is this is the end of his 40 days and 40 nights. And what do we see here? I'll bet you every single one of you have been taught that this is a picture of Pentecost. Okay? Listen to what it says. It's starting in Acts 32, verse, 30, uh, verse 26. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Verse 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Now, I am positive, at least, some, at least all of you who have been around for a little while as a Christian, have heard this taught, that this is the equivalent of Pentecost, right? Well, you're right. It is the equivalent of Pentecost. But what has your church told you that day is? The 50-day count to the 6th of Sivan, right? Which they say, oh, but Easter, because they're the corrupted church, they say Easter on Sunday, but what is it? They're talking about the 50-day count, right? From Resurrection Day, the Jews do the, the Omer count, which doesn't even exist. They do an Omer count to get to the 50th day, which they call Shavuot, right? The Feast of Weeks, and the church calls Pentecost. Do you know how impossible that is? Do you know how literally impossible that Exodus 32:28 Pentecost cannot at all be where they call Pentecost. There must be scholars and others that have seen it. But the church has just resolved and said, no, 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 we're just going to do that 50-day count. That's it. I'm going to prove it to you. We used to talk about this years ago. I totally forgot. And Mike brought it back to my attention the other day when we were talking. And I was like, what? I totally forgot about it. Apply it to what we know now, and it's awesome. Okay, watch this. We know, again, we've shared this, right? Here's Exodus chapter 12. This is the beginning of your years, right? The first month. We're not going to focus on this today, 
okay, as the possibility, you know, if Moses was here today, he looked up, he'd see Taurus, he would say, this is month one. We're not going to look at it like that. We're going to go with the understanding that, hey, when Jesus was here, it was Aries, and guess what? That was the first month. So now we're two months off, and we're in Pisces. Okay, then that's month one, and that's why the third month in Taurus is first fruits, you see? So just as Jesus was first fruits, we are first fruits. He was without leaven, we are with leaven, but we're still both first fruits. Jesus was the first of the first fruits, as Exodus 34, 26 says. So it would be like they're both at the same time. However, this is what we're talking about today. If they're both at the same time, uh, we should have been gone. You see, we should have been gone. But we should have been gone if the count was the John into Luke into Acts count. Okay, if we're counting the John count, which starts with seven, then has the 40 days, and then the last three to end the 50, well, then guess what? The pre-trib should have happened already. But what if we follow the second possibility of a count? And you're going to see why I'm doing it. We've shared this before, right? And, and again, just recently, when did they leave Jerusalem? Uh, when did they leave Egypt? We know, right? It says in Exodus 12, starting verse 30, and Pharaoh rose up in the night. So in the evening of the 14th, right? Bang! The firstborn were killed. See? And all his servants, so Pharaoh rose up in the night and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise up and get ye forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel and go and serve uh, the Lord as you have said, took their flocks, everything. So when did they leave? They left on the 15th day of the first month. When we get to Exodus 19, what does it say in 19.1? In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Why is there, you see, you can never get a room of people to have everybody agree. It's craziness. It tells you when. When the children of Israel gone forth out of the land of Egypt the same day. But it's the third month. So if they left on the 15th day of the first month, and it's the third month the same day from when they left, then when did they get there? Uh, the 15th day of the third month. It certainly is not the sixth day of the third month. Hello? You see, these, these events, they're, they're all corrupted. All of these. Now, are there Jews and are there churches that really understand these things? I'm sure there are some. But do you know what happens? They can't teach on them. Do you know that when they were at seminary school, they're not taught those things. They are taught the ways of the things that are already established. They don't want to go and change it all. Do you know what happens when you go to a big church and they've got their elders and their board and everybody else? And you go and you bring about revelation, you teach it to the pastors. Do you understand why we don't have any pastors that teach in churches here? In, in significant sized churches with boards and everybody else? Why don't they ever listen? Because they can't. Either one, they're choosing not to because no, this is the way we do it. Or if they're seeing it and they bring it to their board, they're shut down and they can't. I remember seeing a story on YouTube not long ago where a pastor was shown something in understanding that somebody had shared about Easter 
And the guy had never heard of it before he was a pastor. He brought it to the elders and, and the board members. And they said, no, you can't teach on that. We won't allow it. He says, but it's the truth. It's right here. We know it. He says, it makes no difference. You teach that and you'll be removed. So guess what the pastor did? He left. He left. I don't remember what he ended up doing, but I don't think he went back to being a pastor. He, he went and did something else. You see? But he loves the Lord and he was seeking him probably more diligently and more in truth. This is the same type of thing right here. The same day is the 15th day of the third month. It's not even kind of. So, what do we have? We have again the 15th day of the third month. If we followed the, the 50 day count from John Luke into Acts, we should have already been gone because this would have been the beginning of the 50 day count. Right? Well, what if we follow the story here in Exodus? Look at what we get. In Exodus 19, verse 3, 15th day of the third month, okay? And then it says in verse 3, uh, well, God, what is it? Uh, yeah, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then shall you be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Okay? Shall have a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Verse, uh, let's go to verse. Yeah, let's go to verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto you, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. Moses told the words unto the people, uh, of the people, unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today. Well, when did he go up? It was the 15th, right? Go unto them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Verse 11, and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Uh-oh, you see what happens? Verse 15, and he said unto the people, be ready against the third day and come not unto your, at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of a trumpet. The voice of the trumpet kind of sounds like Revelation 4, right? Exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. What are we seeing here? This was John's. John, Luke into Acts, it was seven, then 40, and then three. What we're seeing in the story of the Exodus is it was, right, today, because it was the 15th, he said today, tomorrow, and be ready on the morning of the seventh day. Could we still be looking at this possibility? Are we somewhere in the window? Okay, this is, this is the hope that I'm giving. It depends when you're watching this, right? You might be watching this over here. Well, then this is now past. But we are still in the window in here of the possibility that we're not actually doing the seven, the 40, and then the three, but it might be the three the 40, uh, sorry, the three, the seven, and then the 40. Watch this. There's your third day, right? And then what happens? Ah, oh, Moses, we can't take it, right? What ends up happening? Here it is. In chapter 20, he gets the 10 commandments, right? It's all the things about the law. 21, and see, it's still about the law. Uh, 22, it's still about the law. 
23, it's still all about the law. And then look what happens in chapter 24. The covenant confirmed. What does he have to do? He's picking the 70 elders. What is this a picture of? It's a picture of the disciples, right? Those worker disciples. And what happens? In Exodus 24, verse 9, then went up Moses, Aaron, and Nahab, and Abu, and the 70 elders. Listen to this. Exodus 24, 10. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not a hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. How crazy is that, right? This would be the representation of the disciples group, right? Look what happens. They end up going what? In Exodus 24, 16, And the glory of God abode on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered in six days, and the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So what do we have? Three days, then seven days, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud and was there for 40 days and 40 nights. What do we have the story of? We have the story from the 15th day, right? To the third day, it's about two and a half days. And then what? Then you have seven days. And then you had your 40 days and 40 nights. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the story of Pentecost after the seventh Sabbath. Hello. Are you catching that? What happens now after this? When Moses is up in the cloud, when he's up there now for 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord, it's all about the sanctuary. Chapter 25 and 26, all about the sanctuary. 27, see, all about the sanctuary, all about the tabernacle, right? Go same 28, 29, 30, 31. Look at the end of 31. At the end of 31, look at the end of it. Verse 18, Exodus 31, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with them. Okay, the 40 days and 40 nights are coming to an end. Upon Mount Sinai, the tables of the testimony, the tables of stone written with the finger of God. When you get to chapter 32, the 40 days and 40 nights are coming to an end, right? God says, oh my goodness, don't delay anymore. You got to get down there. Look at what they've done. They've done the golden calf, right? All of this craziness, look at what they're doing. Moses, you got to get down. So Moses comes down. When does Moses come down now? Well, guess what? When did God tell him? When did the count of 50 days begin? In the third month. In the third month from the same day they left Egypt. Today, tomorrow, you see? then the seven, and then the 40. So that means this is the end of a total of 50 days from the 15th day of the third month. And what did he say? Go and slaughter, and they slaughtered what? About 3,000. Your churches, your teachers, your pastors, everybody has told you for centuries that that day is the 50th day, or what the church calls Easter Sunday. This is what they call the 50th day. This is what they say. The church will tell you. This is our Pentecost, they'll tell us. This is the Pentecost for the church at the 50th day. When, when the 3,000, about 3,000 were slaughtered. To when Acts chapter 2. When it says, where is it? When it says, 
Where is it? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It should have been easily highlighted, Al. What are you doing? I know what I'll do. I've got it saved up here. Okay, maybe I don't. <laughs> I've got it saved in one of these. It'll help me instead of looking through all. Again. There it is. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> verse 41. So Acts chapter 2, verse 41. There it is. Then they that received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You have all heard from a pastor that the Exodus story of the 50-day count, the three, the seven, and the 40 days and 40 nights, is a picture of the 50 days to Pentecost. Then why on earth is Pentecost told to you to be the 6th to the 8th or wherever the Sunday is? Why on earth is this Pentecost? It cannot be Pentecost. Pentecost is 50 days later. Not maybe, not a little bit, not kind of, not sort of, not let me double check and see. It started from the self same day, from the same day of the third month when they left to go into the wilderness, that 15th, maybe even 16th, because it's called the beginning, right? Do you see how you've been deceived? You're going to try and tell me there's not a single pastor out there teaching Pentecost is here that doesn't know it actually didn't begin till the 15th, 16th day of the third month? And they try to sell you that the bill of goods, that this is when the 3,000 were saved and this is when the 3,000 were killed. Do you understand how it's just deception and ignorance? It's crystal clear, isn't it? Exodus is the story. It is a picture of the 3,000 that were killed, about 3,000 killed and about 3,000 saved, which is the picture, like Mike was talking to a, to a Jewish guy, I think it was a rabbi, and he says, well, don't really worry about that. It's more of a picture of the saving of the Spirit, right? The salvation that the Spirit has. Maybe it was a Messianic rabbi, right? The salvation that the Holy Ghost has, right, in Christ. So it's more powerful, of course, than the man and the falter and stuff that they did. Well, of course, that's true. But it doesn't change the count that everybody's been deceived in thinking. Because you know what happens is once you understand that, there's some serious questions that come about. And the first one that we've shared on that's simple is that the Feast of Weeks is seven Sabbaths complete even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, which is what? The 16th day of the third month. According to, right? According to Exodus, even unto the morrow after the Sabbath, uh, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number 50 days. We've covered it so many times. It is a 50-day count after the seventh Sabbath. You see, 50 days, not the 50th day, but 50 more days, right? For anybody that's new, we've shared this so many times. Look at Passover in the 14th day and on the 15th day. Don't you think that if it was meant to be the 50th day, it would have said just like these, the 14th day, the 15th day? Don't you think it could have simply said, then shall you number? the 50th day? No. It said, then shall you number 50 days. You're to count 50 more days. It's right there in the Exodus story. We've been duped. 
We've known this for a long time, but now we have the clarity of the Feast of Weeks. We have the clarity of the 50 that follows. So how is this not understood from the Gospels? That's where it gets tricky, doesn't it? Right? How do you get from the resurrection story of John into Luke into Acts, the actual Pentecost, when you go into John chapter 20, and John chapter 20 is the resurrection? John chapter 20 is the resurrection. So then the 16th day of the first month is the resurrection, and that starts the 50 days? You see what I'm saying? This is why within the Gospels, it's never really been understood. The mystery is hidden within it. Because John 20 is the resurrection, Luke 24, Mark 16, Matthew 28, they're all resurrection stories. Do you see what's happening? If this is the resurrection story, yet it's the beginning of the 50 days, which then has the eighth, which then goes into Luke's discourse as the beginning of the 40 days for the two on the road to Emmaus, well then, how is that possible? Because Luke's is also the resurrection story. How can it be the resurrection story and yet the beginning of the 50 and you go to Luke, which is supposed to be the start of the 40 days, and it's also the resurrection story. And yet it's a 40-day count. This is why the churches and the, the seminaries and all that's behind it have simply gone with a 50-day count. Do you understand why if you go from Luke and you know why they did this? Because they know it's Luke who wrote the book of Acts. So they take Luke and his resurrection story, and they take Luke and they go into Acts. That's why if you take the resurrection story from Luke, you say, oh, well, it's only 40 days. Do you know why they do it from Luke? For two reasons. One, Luke is the story that goes into the New Testament that goes from the resurrection to the Holy Ghost. Mark and Matthew do not have the same ending of what they're being told to go out and to do. Do you remember? In, in the appearance of the disciples, in, in their, in their uh, um, what is it? In, in what they're commanded to go out and do. He gives them the understanding, and then this is their commission. In Luke 24, 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father um, upon you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So what did they do? They take the Luke resurrection story, not the John, not the Mark, not the Matthew. They take the Luke resurrection story and say, see, it's 40 days into the book of Acts. There's your 40 days. And these are the two that were following him. So they're saying, see, it's just Luke. It's 40 days. And when the 40 days are over, the not many days from now must be 10 days because it's 50 days to Pentecost. So then they say, see, it's 10 days to Pentecost. But it's not true. We have proven it in Exodus. It is right there laid out in crystal clear English. And Greek and, or, or, and Hebrew, if you know Hebrew. It is right there. This is not... Uh, uh, the Feast of Weeks. It is 50 days that begin after the seventh Sabbath, 
which means it begins on the 16th day of the third month. You following? This is why. So I am certain that in the Old Testament, they knew these things, even, even the seminaries today. I am certain that in the seminaries today and throughout history, they have understood the story of Exodus. They have understood that it's 50 days from the 16th day of the third month, that 15th into the 16th day. I'm certain they knew it. The problem is they could not reconcile it with the Gospels. So they took Luke's Gospel and ran with Luke's Gospel. And they completely left John, Mark, and Matthew. Now do you understand why there's an issue? Now do you understand how everything is twisted? Can, do, do I blame them on all of it? No, in part, I don't really blame them. And do you know why? Because they never received the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. The revelation is hidden within the Gospels. Time to be revealed is the end of days. The preparation for the end of days. It was revealed here in this ministry over several years now. The revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. It is not simply Luke into Acts, 40 days and then 10. That is not the truth. Let me show you the truth. <clears throat> and you guys have seen this before, and I'm going to bring more clarity to it as well. It's right here. When this, when this revelation first revealed itself about, I don't know, two to three years ago, I freaked out. It was so awesome. Listen to what it says. You see, because when they take only Luke and go into Acts and say 40 and then, oh, it's got to be 10 days because that's all that's left. Do you know why they do that? On top of the fact that they just didn't know who the Gospels were speaking to is because one, Luke is the one that writes the Gospels and then it goes to the rest of the New Testament. But two, yes, they didn't know who the Gospels were speaking to. But three, you've all been told it was only the apostles. Hello. You have all been told it's the apostles and those disciples that followed the apostles. All you've been told is it's just the 12, right? It was the 12, then minus one. Then there was only 10 at the anointing. Then Thomas shows up and there's the 11th. and then. Right before the time of the 50 days, they, they choose, what was it, Matthias? They choose Matthias, and now they've got the 12 again. You've all only been told 12. Do you know why? Because they never knew who the Gospels were speaking to. We have proven it, guys. We have proven it in the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, and the revelation that confirms it all is right here. You see, it's one thing to see it and to understand it in the Exodus, but then you take it from the Exodus and you see that 50 days come after the Feast of Weeks. That means you can now confirm and understand Leviticus 23 with the Feast of Weeks and then numbering 50 days. But when you try to take it out and count it out and bring it into the New Testament, you got to say, uh, how do we do that? I can see it. I know it's true, but we can't show it out in the New Testament. So guess what? Anybody asks about it, we just say, no, 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 no. It's just the 50th day. No, no, no. It's just the 50th day. But it's not. It's not because it started in the third month. Here is the revelation. First Corinthians 15, four. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Listen to this. And that he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the 12. Let me show you something. Have you ever wondered why in the book of Revelation, 
in chapter 12, uh, sorry, in chapter 5, book of Revelation, chapter 5, listen to this, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 12 elders fell down before the Lamb? No, 24. Revelation 5, verse 8 says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Not 12, 24. And the world will tell you, well, that's the Old Testament heads of the tribes. Well, yeah, what about the New Testament and what it tells us? There were more than 12 that were following Jesus. And it's right here in 1 Corinthians 15. So again, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, listen to what it says. 5 through 8. After that, so from his resurrection, after that, he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the 12. We've broken this down in the past, haven't we? Who are the ones represented as the 12? The heads of the 12 tribes. Matthew. Matthew. If you recall, who are the ones that represent the 12? The ones that when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, right? In, in Matthew chapter 28, listen to their great commission. You see, the 11 disciples. You see, this is what throws everybody off. The 11, the 11, the 11 throughout each gospel. But the mystery that is hidden within that you can find everywhere. In, in, in uh, Matthew, you read about it in so many places, the 12, the 12, the 12. In fact, let's go to chapter 26. Watch this. Okay? This is when he's going to have his meal with the pas uh, his Passover meal, right? In Matthew 26, verse 20, it says, Now, when even was come, he sat with the 12. Interesting, right? He sat with the 12. Let's go see what Luke says. Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, you have him having his meal, the Passover meal with the disciples. Look at what it says. You have the Passover meal, and then you have what? The 12 apostles. Okay? His disciples were up here. Okay? This is who he's having that seven day, right? At the end of seventh day. And then you've got what? The apostles. So you've got you have more than one group. This is precisely what you're seeing in first, oh, actually, let me go back to Matthew, because this group in first Corinthians, chapter 15, verse five, this 12 is the Matthew group right here. I've proven it before, and I'll prove it to you again. Their commission, first of all, is completely different. What is Matthew? What does the end of Matthew represent? the end of tribulation and the time of the millennial reign okay it says starting in verse 15 it said and the 11 disciples went away into galilee into a mountain where jesus had appointed them and when he saw him and when they saw him they worshiped him but some doubted All right doubting thomas at this point right remember john 20 is the beginning and it's the end this is the end and jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach. When is all power given unto him in heaven and earth? At the seventh trumpet. Go read it. And go, go ye therefore <coughs> and teach all nations. How come there's no preaching? How come there's no preaching? Because he's now returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. The whole world will have seen him. All power in heaven on earth is given unto him. Go and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Listen, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. What's he going to command them? He's going to command all the nations that remain how to observe the ways of the Lord and when to come and visit him, right, at tabernacles. Just like you read in Zechariah 14. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Why? Because at the end of trumpets, he is going to be here now with them unto the end of the world. 
So who are these 12? We know exactly who they are. Revelation chapter 21. When New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, look at what it says. In verse 12. And had walls. So it's talking about New Jerusalem. And had a wall, great and high, and had 12 gates. And the 12 gates, the 12 angels. Who are these 12 gates? What do these 12 gates represent? And the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes. Hello. What are the 12 foundations? They're the 12 apostles. That's the John group. That's the John group. And then what? It has walls. So what does that mean? To have the foundation, you need foundations first. That's the John. The John represents the apostles. And what does it say about the apostles? They're the first ones anointed, right? They're the ones that get breathed on. They're the ones that are also there during seals that are laying the spiritual foundation while a physical one is also going to be laid. When the foundations are laid, then you can build the walls. And the walls are the measurement of 144, like the 144,000 who will work during trumpets when the temple and the walls and the streets will be rebuilt. When are the gates? What is the picture of when the gates will be rebuilt? During the millennial reign. You see, the gates can't be built until the walls are built. The walls will be built and completed. And by the end of trumpets, then when the millennial reign starts, when the Lord is here, feet down on the Mount of Olives, everything's done. He is now <clears throat> all power in heaven and on earth. They will go and teach the world that remains how to observe the ways of the Lord. And he's here with them till the end of the world. They are the first Corinthians 15 that he met with first after resurrection. He met with the first group, which are represented by the 12. Listen to this. This is what caught me. Verse 6, after that. Verse 7, after that. That means he met with different groups at different times. So after he met with the 12, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. What does this represent? <coughs> The time of the great multitude and the 144,000. The 144,000. There's 12. There's 12. And then what do you have? The in-between are the ones who represent the walls. This is represented by what? Mark's group. When we come to the end of Mark, <clears throat> look at the commission these guys get. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat in meat. And he unbraided, okay? He railed. He was upset with them because they weren't prepared, ready, and really watching. This is the end of seals. Um, he unbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen. Go and preach the gospel unto every creature. Whoa, wait a second. <clears throat> Verse 15 says, partway three, through, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature all of a sudden there's preaching he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned taken up serpents you see but it won't hurt them Rev uh, uh, mark 16 verse 19 then uh so then after the Lord had spoken unto them. He was risen up unto, into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. When is he actually going to sit finally at the right hand of God? Is going to be at the end of seals, right? We've taught on that so many times. And verse 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. This isn't I'm with you now until the end of the world go and teach only 
This is trumpets when he's sitting now at the end of seals. Trumpets begins. He's sitting on the right hand of the father as high priest and king. Right? Like Melchizedek, like Psalms 110. And what does it say? The Lord working with them. Why? Because he is now the greater Aaron. He is the Melchizedek, high priest and king. And the 144,000 are what? They're the Levitical. They're the priestly line going out during the time of trumpets, going out and following him wheresoever he goes. This is why in Revelation chapter 14, in verse 1, you read, And lo, I looked, uh, sorry, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000, there with the lamb on Mount Zion, having the Father's name written in their foreheads. Hello. You see? Uh, 144,000 redeemed from the earth. Uh, verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. Well, how about that? Mark chapter 16. Those who represent the walls during the time while the walls are being laid. It's the same ones that say at the end of Mark, verse 20, <clears throat> and they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. These are the walls, guys. This is the greater multitude of people. They help bring in the rapture group, right? You see, they're going to help bring in the rapture group with the two that they didn't believe, right? The remnant that are alive from the, the John group and from the Elijah group that we spoke about in the last video, represented by those two from Luke. You see, they're not believing the, the testimony from these guys that, hey, the Lord's coming, this is the time. And when the Lord appears unto them, he's going to rail on the 144,000 before he seals them. This, this is them. This is them. This is the second group in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. It's the after that. So you've got the Mark group, the 12, the after that, Mark, uh, sorry, the first group in verse 5, the 12 is the Matthew group, and the verse 6, the after that, is the Mark group. Then what does it say? Then we get the understanding of the 50 days from John. Listen to what it says. Verse 7, after that, after that, who is the after that? It starts John. Why? Because then it's the 50 days. It's just like the story, seven Sabbaths and then John and then Luke. So what do you get? After that, he was seen of James, listen to this, then of all the apostles. Hello. The apostles are what? The foundation layers. Who are the apostles represented by in the seven churches? They're represented by the church of Ephesus, which is the first seven days to the Lord's return on the eighth day. Which is what? The start of the 50 days. So you, are, are you seeing what's happening here? Within what took place of the people he met with, these two the Matthew group and the Mark group who had different commissions were the what? What, what, did this what was this period of time? The seven Sabbaths, brothers and sisters. The seven times seven Sabbaths. This was the Feast of Weeks count of the seven Sabbaths. What do we see in verse 7? After that, what do we see? The apostles. We just saw through all this study that the apostles are represented by John chapter 20. So he meets what? Now the 50 days are starting. After that, here he is meeting with the apostles, the, the John chapter 20 group. And then verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. This is the representation of the Luke 
group. This is the Luke group, which means this was the seven times seven Sabbaths. This was the start of the 50 days and the typology to the end of the 50 days. You following? We've revealed this. We revealed this a long time ago. But now that we can tie it back into the Exodus and prove it all out from the old to the new. What confused the church, what was hidden in it, is that every story was connected to the resurrection. So how were they to understand it? You have 12 right here, and then you've got the apostles, which are the 12. Hello. Well, what 12 was this then? Why does Revelation chapter 5 say there were 24? 12 and 12, hello. Well, why, does Revela why does Revelation 21 talk about the 12 who are gates, have the apostles who are the 12 foundations, and the 144,000 or 144 is the larger group as the one in the middle who represents the walls? When it's foundations, walls, gates. Foundations, walls, gates. John, Mark, Matthew, which in top to bottom is Matthew, Mark, John, Luke. So what does that mean in the end? Here's the beauty of it. You see this? In the end of days, it goes in reverse. It goes in reverse. We've taught on this, right? So what do you see? First of all, the last, right, will be first, and one born out of due time. Wasn't that interesting? We know this one, right? Isaiah 66, verse 7. Before she travailed, she brought forth. What does that mean, before she travailed? Revelation chapter 12. What do we see? Uh, the woman appeared, right? Verse 12. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth. So before she travailed, the pre-trib has to happen. The pre-trib has to happen. So who is Paul representing here? In this case, he's representing the pre-trib bride of Christ. One born out of due time. What does that mean? One born premature. One born before the travailing. Before the travailing. And so what people will say, they'll say, well, wait a second. I thought you said the 50 days begins with the apostles, which is John chapter 20. And then the 40 days go to the Luke group. It does. But remember what the end of days goes as? Luke's group is the pre-trib, gorgeous, white, radiant robe pre-trib bride of Christ. Do you remember what it said in Luke 24? Only Luke's gospel, do you read this from the resurrection story in Luke chapter 3? And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Who is the body of the Lord Jesus? His bride. When the two become one. So what you're really seeing is the pre-trib escape, then it goes to John chapter 20. This is the representation in Luke 4 of the pre-trib escape. But when you follow everything from the story of looking like it's all resurrection, 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 you're not going to see it through the forest, right? The trees for the forest. You're missing. Mary Magdalene is this typology of the bride here as well in John chapter 20. But the real story is Luke, John, you see? What is the end of day story of 1 Corinthians 15? It's the pre-trib, bride of Christ, Luke, white, radiant robe. But what do we know happens from among this group? We also know there's that remnant bride. Do you guys realize that nobody understands the mystery of this remnant bride? Everybody believes it's the 144,000 that come first. Why? 
because it's as if they're at the end of Mark and there's only seven years of Matthew. Do you get it? That's why the end of Mark and that commission and he rails on them and so forth and, and he's there with them. And so it's all connected to the 144, but the church doesn't understand who the gospels are speaking to. So they don't realize that they're at the end of Mark. They're all talking about the great multitude rapture in the 144 as if they're at the end of seals. This is the Luke bride of Christ and there's a remnant worker bride that remains from among them. You see, but this is talking about what? The bride of Christ going pre-trib before she travails. One born out of due time, premature, before the travailing. And then what happens? John chapter 20. And then what happens? Mark, right? The, the disciples were already chosen, remember. The disciples of Luke were already told ahead of time at the time of the pre-trib escape. They were already informed. So after the escape, when the Lord returns, then on the eighth day, it's the apostles. And then what? Then you've got the 144,000. Rapture in 144. And then what? Then you've got the 12 at the end of trumpets that go out during the millennial reign. So what, is, what did this reveal for us in the end of days? What do we know? 50 days. 50 days, right? Pre-trib. The Lord returning, right? The, the Lord with the apostles, the, the John chapter 20, the 50 days starting. And when the 50 days are over, what is it? Mark's seven years of seals. And then Matthew's seven years of trumpets. So in reverse, what do you have? 50 days, seven and seven. 50 days, seven and seven what was it from top to bottom in the is when it happened it was seven times seven seven and seven sabbaths seven and seven sabbaths and then the 50 days in reverse it's the 50 days and the seven and seven years 50 days, seven years, and seven years. So what comes before the 50 days? What comes before the 50 days? Well, you still got to fulfill the seven Sabbaths. You see, you still have to fulfill the seven Sabbaths. And then you'll have your 50 days. And in the end, what does it reveal? 50 days, seven years, and seven years. From top to bottom, this is the evidence that he met with one group, a second group, which is the Matthew group, the Mark group, then he met with the John group, and then the picture of the Luke group. That's why it goes Matthew, Mark, 50 days, then begin at John, go into Luke, and ends in Acts chapter 2. It is the exact revelation of the picture of the Exodus. And it could never be understood because each gospel in Matthew, Mark, and Luke ends with the picture of the resurrection. And John chapter 20, the second last gospel, uh, the second last chapter, ends with the story of the resurrection. So how could they have ever explained it without understanding who the Gospels are speaking to? Now you can see it for yourselves, especially if you're newer. This commission is teaching, and it's when the Lord is here, feet down on the Mount of Olives to the end of the world. Mark's commission is completely different. He unbraids on them. He's going to give them power. They're preaching and not teaching they're going to the world there's also baptizing and there he's now seated on the right hand of god and 
he's there with them, working with them and giving them signs and wonders following. In Luke's group, their commission is again completely different. He doesn't unbraid on them. He doesn't freak out and lose it on them. In fact, it's the only group where he sits down, eats with them, and serves them as he said he would in Luke chapter 12 when he returns from the wedding, which this is a picture of him coming on the eighth day. He will then open unto them their understanding. And what are they to go do? They're to go and what? That repentance and remissions of sin should be preached. In his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And they're the only ones that are to go start from Jerusalem and wait for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Exodus 12 to 32 is the revelation of the seven times seven Sabbaths and then 50 days to Pentecost. It is the evidence of Leviticus 23, seven Sabbaths, then number 50 days. And I told you that I would also prove it. So we have shown that the true end of 50 and the true Pentecost is after the seven Sabbaths. And you saw that about 3,000 were killed and about 3,000 were saved. Now you know the truth of where the count should be. Let me prove to you another one. Check out this one. In, uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, we've talked about how at the end of the year, so one of these year's end connections, Syria is coming up with a smaller army and the Jews are all proud and think that they're going to be able to destroy the Syrians. You see, in 2 Chronicles 20, 24, verse 23 and 24, in 24 it says, For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a great host into their hand, because they had forsaken the Lord of God of their fathers. Because Jerusalem had, see? Because Ju Judah and Jerusalem had forsaken. This is the attack by Syria at the end of the 50 days when the 14 years will begin. This attack right here is 100% the Isaiah 9 attack when after the light affliction, son of man for 40 days, son of man is gone, and then what? Bam! The Syrians come, destroy them, and they're cut off. This is why during the first seven years of seals, the Jews are removed from the land, except for a small portion that will be brought back in to begin the rebuilding of which only the foundation will be rebuilt in the midst of the seven years of seals. Okay? Now, there's no number here though, right? There's nothing about the number, just their destruction. All right? Same with 2 Chronicles 24. There was, there was no mention of the number. Well, watch this. What do we know about Ishmael? Okay? We've discussed this about Ishmael as well. In chapter 16, what happens? Abraham's 84 years old. Ishmael is born. Ishmael is a wild man. He's a representation of Syria. And now, Abraham in Genesis 17, Abraham's 99. God makes a covenant with him. That's after 13 years. Okay? After 13 years of tribulation. In the 14th year, the Lord renews that covenant in that final year. And what does it say? Abraham was 99 years old, okay? In Genesis 17, verse 24 and 25, and Ishmael was 13 years old. Meaning the Antichrist is there at the beginning, and yet he's still there at the end in this typology. What do we know about him coming again when he's brought back at the end? Well, watch this. In 1 Kings chapter 20, listen to what happens. It's about the king of Syria coming, right? Listen to what happens. 
Okay? Listen to this. In 1 Kings chapter, I think maybe it's even a little bit earlier and a little bit later. Okay, watch this. And then we'll go back up. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 22, And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, so again, another connection to the return of the year, the king of Syria will come against thee. But remember, now he's pride, he's boastful, right? And it says, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And what happened? Verse 26, And it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Apic to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before the two little flocks of kids, but the Syrian, like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians fl filled the country. Now the Syrians have the big battle, right? Now the Syrians have the big army, not like the first attack. In the first attack, the Syrians had a small one, like now. And they're going to be victorious over Jerusalem, who has the bigger one. This time, Syria, at the end, at the end of the 13 years, in that 14th year, Syria is coming with a great army again. And they're going to have the, or sorry, they're going to have the great army this time. And Jerusalem, the Jews are going to have a smaller amount. And then it says in verse 28, And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. What happens? The Syrians were destroyed and Israel was victorious. And when does this happen in the picture of the end of days? At the end of 13 years. At the end of the 13 years of tribulation, in the 14th year, exactly as you read in Zechariah chapter 14, when the Jews will come around, they will also fight in the war. And with the Father, they will be victorious. Okay, this is at the end of what? At the end of 13 years. And then this great big battle. Okay, well, watch this. If you go back just a little bit, in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 13, and behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast seen, all this great multitude, this is his army. Behold, I will deliver into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, okay? Oh, sorry, sorry, he's talking to Israel. That I am the Lord. Now watch this, in verse 15. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the province, and they were 232. And after them, he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, 7,000. At the end of the picture of the, 13, uh, of the 13 years, we have the picture of 7,000 being numbered and the great attack starting in the end of the 13th year and the 14th year represented as the end in the 14th year of trumpets, when the Ishmael, Antichrist, Syrian type is then going to be destroyed. We've taught on this many times. So what is the end of the 13th year look like? There's a picture of 7,000 that were numbered. Well, lo and behold, the Old Testament had, uh, uh, had 3,000 that were slain at the end of the 50 days. In Acts, in the New Testament, we had what? About 3,000 that were saved at the end of 50 days. 
seven Sabbaths, and then at the end of 50 days for both cases? Well, what about the 7,000 numbered at the end of the 13th year as the 14th year battle is about to come, just as Zechariah 14 said, when the big battle comes, when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and it says that even Judah, right? Even Judah, verse 14, Zechariah 14, verse 14. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem in that day, right? Well, watch this. Go to Revelation chapter 11 and look at what we see in Revelation chapter 11 at the end of the sixth trumpet, the end of the 13th year. In verse 13, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. And in the quake, there was slain of men 7,000. The 3,000 were slain, 3,000 were saved in the new. In the old, 7,000 were, were protected, right? They defeated. And in the new, in the is to come, 7,000 would fall, were slain. Do you see the picture going on here? Do you realize that these 7,000 are 7,000 being saved by the Lord? Did you know that? Romans chapter 11, verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed down, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You see that? He's got 7,000 reserved for when? He has 7,000 reserved till the end of the 13th year of tribulation, the end of the sixth trumpet, the 7,000 slain. 7,000 victorious, 7,000 slain. 3,000 slain, 3,000 victorious. Both of them directly connected to where they should be in the old and in the new, revealed in both places at both times, directly in order. You're going to try and tell me we haven't understood it? Then you need to spend some more time and follow what's being shared. The books are open, brothers and sisters. We have understood it. We have proven every bit and part and piece of this from Scripture. So what does this mean for the time we're in right now? It means we may still have a little bit of time. You might be listening to this and about to vanish. If we're following the Exodus count. Because in the Exodus count, it was three days before the seven days began. Is this possible? Is it possible that it's then seven and then the 40 days? Actually, it would have to start here, right? So is it possible that it's the three, then the seven, then the 40? Well, there was a reason I was leading you in to these other parts. We know that the Son of Man is the white horse rider. When the white horse rider is done and the white horse rider is gone, look at what it says. We don't know how long it's going to take before he decides to open the red horse rider, the second seal. When he opens the second seal, is it possible? We don't have a period of time in between telling us from verse 2 to verse 3 of Revelation 6. If you just followed it as it's laid out, this is the 40 days, verse 1 and 2. Verse 3 and 4 is the end of 50 days. If this is the case, it could be that the seven-day wedding has taken place. The, the, the first seal is open and the Son of Man goes out. 
And then when he returns, the, the red horse rider, sorry, the second seal is now open at the end of 40 days. And it would be when peace is removed, the Holy Ghost has anointed them, and the attack takes place. We're not given any period of time between the second and the third verse or between the end of the white horse and the start of the second horse, the red horse. Is it possible that there is this two and a half days, the 16th, 17th to early in the morning where something right now is brewing and the Lord will sound the trumpet and show up the early in the morning on the third day in the morning. I don't know if you guys remember this. I know some people don't like it when I talk about dreams or people's visions that they've had. I don't have them, but I was talking with Mike about it today. Am I saying this is anything? No. I don't know, but I am simply connecting it because guess what? It's June and the seventh early in the morning on our side of the world is later in the evening on the 6th of June. Okay. So Jerusalem time early in the morning at sunrise is later in the evening on the west side of the world, right? In North America. Okay, North and South America, all right? So, if you guys remember, some of you have seen this. I remember seeing it maybe three or four years ago that um, Aaron from, I think it's called Sparrow Cloud 9 or Sparrow Cloud something, she had a vision years ago, a few years ago, and in the vision, she a vision dream, whatever it is, and in it, the rapture had taken place she had woken up in this dream vision, and when she had woken up in it, she saw the news was on, and CNN was on, and CNN said that it was June 7th, everybody should stay in their houses because a global event has happened and people around the world have vanished. Okay? There was more to it. I don't remember it all. I couldn't find it to bring it up, but I always remembered that one that it was June 7th. I don't talk about dreams and visions all the time. I rarely do. Even in the last one, I spoke about it because it's connected to what? To the Lord God's true feast of weeks timing. Am I saying it's going to be here on the third day in the Moses count of the 50 days? No, I'm saying it's possible. I have shown you from John into Luke into Acts and 3,000 people after the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks. I have shown you from Exodus the three, the seven, and the 40 to 3,000 killed at the end of a seven Sabbath Feast of Weeks to a 50-day count to true Pentecost. There were only two counts. There were only two counts. And on the third day, when the Lord God came on the Exodus count in the thick cloud, what did people do? They freaked out at what? The thick cloud thunders and lightnings, and a voice. Does that sound familiar? I remember a sister asking me to study some things in relation to thunders, lightnings, and a voice. Because what you're going to find out is it appears that thunders, lightning, and voice happen in pre, mid, and post, and at the very end. It's the voice of God. Thunders, lightnings, and a voice like a trumpet. 
What if we go to Revelation <clears throat> chapter 5 again? Let's see what it says. Where is it? Oh, wait, chapter 4. Chapter 4. Heaven was open, and he heard, as it were, a trumpet talking with him. And he sees the throne and everything else and unto crystal. We don't have the rest of that description in here, but I think we have it in five. Remember, he's still seeing, right? Let's see. I think it's probably in here somewhere. Redeemed from the people. See, you see the rapture group is now there before them. No. So, but what we do see is a voice that he heard like a trumpet speaking to him. We didn't see this in the John one, did we? In the John chapter 20, or even in the one starting from, from Luke in the pre-trib typology, we didn't get a voice like trumpet. There was no voice like trumpet. So what I'm saying is this is possible. It's possible that this was the seventh Sabbath and this began the one, two, and a half because it's the third day in the morning. It's possible. But I can tell you this, that if we're still here, you wake up on June 7th and everything is still the same, then hold on tight. Because this count is what? This is the count that gives us our John count again into Luke, into Acts, that lines up with everything we had just broken down prior to in relation to Thomas Didis, Didymus, right? To Gemini, to the circuit of the sun, after the seven-day wedding. There's only two options. You see, does the John 1 work in this one? No. The John 1 won't work in this. We can't say, okay, there's one day, two, and then the half day, and then you've got the seven-day wedding. It's past the circuit of the sun. You see, there's no connection. For this reason and for many other is why... I believe the true count we're looking for is the John into Luke into Acts. But I can't say with 100% certainty. So I'm saying, always be ready from here on out. Because in the first option, it's either here or it's here to his 40 days. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray this has filled you with a ton of understanding to be able to see the mystery of the seven Sabbaths to the count of Pentecost, brothers and sisters. In the Gospels revealed, confirmed in the Exodus, revealed and understood, or understood, I should say, in Leviticus, it is all true, and it was hidden in the revelations of the Gospels, and it was the end of days that revealed the revelation to us by understanding who the Gospels are speaking to in the is to come with seven and seven and the 50th Jubilee was the revelation of the seven times seven and the 50 days to Pentecost. A day's count with days, and a year's count to years. It is the mystery of the end of days revealed. Brothers and sisters, I hope and pray you have understood it. I hope and pray we are here in one of these two places. Remember, the Lord is the ox and the cross, the aleph and the top. We have revealed the beginning. 
this is, as I close out, this is the end of the possibility of Taurus being the beginning of that 7 to 40 and then 3, or 3, then 7, then 40. Do you understand why I was showing that in the, in the other part with in the beginning? How it can also be a picture of the first seven? And then verse three of Genesis is him coming as light at his birth? Because his birth is also told to us to be connected to his birthday. And Genesis three was when he was made light. As much as I am truly hopeful for here, and I am hopeful every single day through here is high alert. But this right here is the extremity of high alerts because his birth connected and him coming at the circuit of the sun to start his 40 days after the wedding. If all of this comes to pass, guys, and nothing is yet changed, hold on tight because there is option two it does not line up with feasts but if this was the beginning to the lord god then yes we are still in it and there is a lot of revelation that is connected to it so with that hold tight we are in the 70th year of israel from when they came into the land of that there is no doubt leviticus 19 is understood and revealed we are only simply only seeking where the lord god father himself says this is my feast of weeks when that day happens this year, the entire world will change in the moment, in the blinking of an eye. Everything is going to change. And as Luke 21 says, as I use this to go out, Luke 21, 34 through 36, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Is it only gonna be one part of the world? Is only one place gonna recognize it? Is some people gonna notice and others don't? Nope. It'll come as a snare on the whole world that was asleep and blind. Do not let that day come upon you unawares. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you all. I love you guys. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you for your prayers over each other and over us and the ministry, for your intercessions that have blessed us and protected us and each other, for your support that has come in for the ministry here and abroad in Uganda. I am grateful. We are grateful. We love you. We thank you. We pray for you each and every night and for your families. Brothers and sisters, we will see each other very soon either in the third heaven in the lowest room or girded about here ready for when he returns and knocks we will see you at his meal gathering for that remnant bride brothers and sisters i love you talk to you soon bye for now